so today um, we get to hear one of my favorite gospel stories, Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And this is a really long story, as you might have picked up on if you, if, if you have been reading along or if you followed along. Uh, and it has lots of characters, lots of action, and lots of dialogue. And yet the de detail that always catches my attention the most is what Jesus does on the way to Lazarus' tomb. And uh, we just talked about it in the children's sermon, but I want to ask again, what does Jesus do? He weeps. Notice that it doesn't say why Jesus weeps. Um, there, there, there's a lot of different reasons. Uh, it could be that he's sad that his friend got sick and suffered and died. It could be that he's sad for the pain that his delay in arriving has caused Martha and Mary. It could be that he's sad because he realizes that the cost of bringing people back to life will be his own death. I wonder if the exact reason for Jesus' tears is less important than the fact that Jesus does cry. More than just tears. He doesn't have just like a tear rolling down his cheek. He's weeping. He's, you know, that gut-wrenching, sobbing, gasping. Jesus is heartbroken. How many of us have been there too? I know I've been there. How many, some, some of us might be there right now. What if Jesus' emotions and actions give us the permission to also be sad? I know this might sound silly at first because we all know that sadness and grief are real feelings and, and important feelings and, uh, you know, instinctual. And yet there seems to be a societal misconception that by being a Christian or going to church, that means you should be happy all the time. How many of us have ever been shamed for our sadness, for our grief, or our depression? I know I've been there. Maybe you've, been, you've even been told that sadness is unchristian because it shows a lack of faith or trust or hope. Today, in the story of Jesus and Lazarus, we see that the weeping and sadness and tears are not only Christian, but they are Christ-like. Notice that Jesus never tells Martha or Mary or any of the other mourners, hey, don't be sad. I'm going to raise him up from the dead. Jesus knows what he's going to do, but yet he doesn't tell other people what they should feel. He allows them and us to feel what we feel without shame or judgment. Also notice that Jesus doesn't try to make anyone feel better by at leasting them. Do you, you, you know what I mean by at least in someone. Uh, you know where, where we try to minimize someone's suffering by pointing out that at least something else bad or worse hasn't happened? Like when we hear that a friend has lost their job and we try to cheer them up and say, but at least you still have your health. Jesus doesn't downplay someone else's suffering or try to up, one-up them. Jesus embraces and embodies his grief and gives his followers permission to do the same. How might recognizing and journeying with our own sadness and grief and that of those around us be especially important in this uncertain and difficult situation which we are now living in? How many of us have lost something important due to the coronavirus? It could be that you have lost time with friends or family. Perhaps you, you have had a significant life event like getting your driver's license or, or uh, having graduation or even a wedding postponed or canceled. Or maybe you've lost a job. Maybe you've been sickened yourself or lost a loved one due to this virus. These are all losses with the capacity to make our hearts ache and I'm left wondering, how can we be church with all of these personal and communal losses going on around us? How can we be like Jesus and weep with those who are heartbroken? Could we reach out to family members and friends and co-workers, teammates and church members? Send them a card, call them, text them, message them, ask them how they are, and really listen. 
and, and, and refrain from minimizing their losses or trying to make them feel better. This crisis is hard, and it will continue to be hard for a while. It is okay to be sad. It is okay to not be okay. It is Christian, it is Christ-like to be sad, to mourn, to be heartbroken, and to grieve our losses. And yet, we also know that we grieve with hope. Not because we have hope, not because we have belief or trust, but because Jesus promises to be with us still today. Jesus says to his disciples and us, I am the resurrection and the life. He doesn't say, I was the resurrection and the life. He doesn't say that I will be the resurrection and the life someday. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Jesus brings life out of hopeless death, not because anyone says, oh, Jesus, we know you can bring it back to life. It'll be cool. Jesus brings life not because of who we are, but because of who Jesus is. He is a life giver, a life bringer, a life dealer, even in the most hopeless, dark, and scary situations. And yet, just bringing one man back from the dead wasn't enough. From Lazarus' tomb, Jesus could no doubt see other tombs, that had, those that had been filled years ago, and ones that would continue to be filled after Jesus left town. One new life wasn't enough, and so Jesus goes to the cross to take grief and sadness and suffering, illness and death into God's very self. Jesus took all of this into himself to provide, promise us that even though we will face all of these things in life, they are no longer the end of the story or our story. God's story doesn't stop at the tomb. On Easter, we hear that there is new life on the other side of the grave, a never-ending life with no more tears. We have been promised this same new life through the water and word of our baptisms. Our lives will be hard and scary and sad at times, but our God is still with us, and there will be life again at the end. This is the good news. This is the gospel. And just as we know that there is life and hope after our physical deaths, there will also be life and hope after COVID-19 and quarantine. How will we, Christ's church, embody this new life after so much loss, after so much suffering? Could we hold a graduation as part of our worship service for those who have lost that opportunity? Could we get training and form our own disaster response team within the church to help future crises? How can our congregation support local businesses as they struggle to rebuild? Jesus shows us that there is life on the other side of death, even though it still bears scars and may look very different than how it looked before. How can you, how can me, how can, how can we embody the life now, here, and today that we are promised when we close our eyes for the last time? We the church, are the resurrection and the life. We are invited to go with hope, to love and serve our God and our neighbors. Thanks be to God and amen.